Welcome to the Mastering the Mind podcast, which is a basis set for our endorsed resource. We have been invited to this year's 2021 ESEP conference to support the division with creating original content by interviewing a variety of conference speakers about their research and reflections. Today's interview is with Professor Richard Thelwell, who is Head of School of Sport, Health and Exercise Science at the University of Portsmouth. Richard is also a HCPC registered sport and exercise psychologist and is currently the basis sport and exercise psychology accreditation route lead. In this episode, Richard shared with his advice to sports psychology students who are wanting to have a successful sports psychology career, how much sports psychology has changed and the challenges current practitioners face in the industry. So let's welcome Richard to the podcast. Yeah, no, a place we like to start with our guests um, to introduce you to our listeners. Um, if you could just introduce yourself. Uh, talk us through your journey from maybe studying to where you are now. Um, yeah, feel free. Okay. So I'm Richard Felwell. I'm the head of school for sport, health and exercise science at the University of Portsmouth and have been head of school there for the last 12 years. Uh, I'm also a practitioner psychologist and I've had the fortune of working across a number of elite sports for probably the best part of 25 years now. So whether it's professional cricket, professional football, a number of Olympic sports, um, I've been very fortunate to have yeah, been able to share the space with, um, with some very special individuals and not just athletes, but coaches and also the organisations. Mm. What made you want to pursue a career in sports psychology? Great question. <laughs> um, I'm a failed cricketer, okay. Right, okay. so um, my, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, back in about 1995, um, I, I didn't actually secure a professional contract, okay. and ironically, it was my head that kind of let me down, mm. and um, I kind of wanted to find out why I struggled so much. And so I kind of became a bit of a case study for myself. Yeah. And in doing so, and coupled with, uh, as I mentioned in my, my lecture, uh, Ian Maynard was one of my uh, lecturers at the time. And he was working as an applied practitioner uh, in professional rugby. And just the, the things he spoke about, the passion that he showed in terms of the subject area, but also how you can actually influence and contribute to the development of others. Yeah, it really ignited a light in me that mm. I thought actually, yeah, I, I quite quite mm. like the look of that. Yeah, but coupled with the fact that I wanted to understand a little bit about myself. Okay, and I've realised over time the next best thing of not actually playing professional sport is being involved in it in some way, shape, or form, and Definitely. I've had the opportunity to do so. What age was that when you didn't secure a professional contract? Uh, so at that age, I was, uh, it was the end of my undergraduate degree. So it would be 21. I'd had three years of kind of summer contracts. But you'd studied throughout. You, studied you, throughout, okay, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, a, a lot of my, um, I've just finished my MSc, and a lot of the research that I did was around um, deselection, but in academy football. Right, um, yeah. Because like my friends growing up, I'm from Leicester, um, and watching them, they were like the boys at school, you know, like, top dogs and then to watch them get released see where they are now it's really sad to see but I looked into like negative transition factors and positive transition factors and it seemed that you had those positive transition factors like ed education or the career plan yeah very very yeah. much so yeah career plan maybe not so much mm. in that I kind of fell into my PhD right and my I was initially interested in uh, individual zone of optimal functioning work with Yuri yeah. Hanning and back then, I suppose, the only real emotion that we spoke about was anxiety. Mm. Uh, but the first study didn't really go, well, it, it did go as, how do I say? It? No, it didn't go according to plan, but because of that, it gave other options. And so we then changed direction. Mm. And so I then started to look at um, the psychology of consistent performance. Okay. So that actually helped me understand myself a little bit better in terms of what is repeatable good performance, what are the psychological constructs associated with it. And I did a number of studies kind of working around what consistent performance is. And then we looked at some intervention work towards the, 
the end. And consistent performance was kind of seen to be just a little bit under, uh, or it shared a number of constructs associated with flow, peak experience, peak performance. Yeah. But when you get into the flow and the peak experience state, a lot of athletes or a lot of the literature at the time was saying that you have that kind of loss of self-consciousness or, you know, loss of, you, you just kind of let time transcend. Yeah. And that was the one thing that was missing. Mm. So all the other bits were the same, but there wasn't that full immersion. Mm. Uh, and, and the way we tried to argue that was that when, when athletes are so driven towards trying to achieve that optimal performance all the time, they then end up striving so hard they have the ups and the downs and the ups mm. and the downs and it becomes a roller coaster whereas if actually you say well these are the parameters that i'm trying to work towards so i suppose an acceptable level of good performance but maybe not the best you're more likely to hit that on a more regular basis mm -hmm. and because you hit that on a more regular basis you're more likely to then maybe hit those higher ones mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. with greater regularity mm -hmm. so that's yeah that's kind of where where it was really and i, I kind of fell into it and yeah that's and it went from there i'm curious so as a player um what was holding you back mentally i'm really curious to know like what were the kind of aspects oh it's interesting to so uh okay so first innings if, if i look if i look back at my my track record of playing second team county cricket first innings was pretty in three day stuff that was it was then first innings was good second innings was bad um a lot of the time First innings was good because I wasn't really paying much attention to who I was playing against. Second innings, I realised I was playing against whoever it was. And so I was playing the name rather than the ball. And as a batter, yeah. that's probably quite a, well, it's the wrong thing to do, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I was kind of obsessing about, oh, I know that, you know, oh, I didn't realise that's the first team player or whatever it was. And we didn't have all the analysis like right. there is now. And, mm. you know, you, if you wanted to find out scorecards, you had to look on CFAX which a number of your listeners will probably not have a clue uh, what exactly. CFAX is, including you two. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> correct. So, so, what's confused? Wait, 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 so there you go. Also, what is this ancient? Uh, so, the so, so, so CFAX, if you go to BBC One, you press, uh, they used to be, it used to be text. Right. And so I used to, used to get, it was kind of a, a TV version of the internet, but yeah. they used to have all the football results. Oh. It was pages and pages and pages, sports results, you know, whatever it would be, news. Yeah. Uh, and ITV had one called Teletext. That's the one I know. Yeah, so it's CFAX yeah. and Teletext. And yeah, Teletext. the only way you could find out about people was kind of through that. that yeah. you, we had no real, unless people were kind of international players or had been on the TV, but it was kind of yeah. right at the very early stages of Sky Sports, for example. Mm. Okay. Um, so obviously you wanted to find out um, not what was wrong with you, but like <laughs> uh, why you, you were struggling so much within um, cricket. Did you find that out? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think I think a lot of it also then came back to, well, who did I want to be myself? Mm. And that's kind of what was a, a bit of a theme of, of, of my talk earlier as well, in that um, I, I, I was probably very fearful of failure as well. Mm. Um, okay. And... I suppose as an introductory session with a lot of performers that I work with now, you'd say, right, you, if you were to stand on one end of a continuum, would you say you're motivated to achieve success or are you motivated to avoid failure? And I'd probably go towards the motivated to avoid failure, which of course meant that you took either ridiculously stupid decisions that were so hard or easy, you didn't take risks, you were constantly worrying about future events. I was never really in the moment. Mm. And... So yeah, I, th I think I probably did find a little bit out about myself. And if I, if I had the support that obviously performers get now, I'm intrigued to know what I could have done. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was te technically good enough, mm -hmm. if I'm brutally honest. But I think that was certainly influenced by my 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 lack of uh, psychological consistency. Mm. Yeah. That fear of failure and um, you know being motivated by that. Is similar to what we covered on the mindset episode about yeah. growth mindset and fixed mindset. So that's super interesting. If anyone wants to go over and listen to that that podcast for sure, I think it's like episode it's four. four yeah, I think yeah, four. yeah. Okay. So talking about right now, your sports psychology career. Um, how much has, has it evolved since you first began? My career or the profession as a whole, yeah. <laughs> significantly. And I, I think that's that's. I suppose that was kind of the main thread of talk in that 
you know, over 25 years, my crystal ball didn't quite tell me everything that maybe looking back, I'd have liked it to have done. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very much a kind of a cognitive behavioral psychological skills training type person, but that's what it was. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that we had to refer to. Um, we didn't really have mental health. We didn't have mental health literacy. Exercise psychology was very flimsy at best in my my experience. Motor control was huge. Mm -hmm. and, and I still believe that that has certainly helped a lot of the things that I do now and have done over the years. We didn't have any of the organizational psych. Okay. Okay. So um, that Back in the nineties, yeah. that wasn't really there. We've literally just had a talk about organisational stressors, yeah. Um, yeah. like a whole podcast that we've done here. So that's interesting. It's pretty new, yeah. Then, yeah. It's more, well, I yeah, I suppose the early two thousand, well, maybe yeah. just a bit before that, some of the initial stuff came out. But yeah, the literature that I referred to back then, we weren't really, we weren't really working as practitioners at an organisational level. It was you work with a, you work with an athlete. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, certainly, don't work with coaches or work with other support staff or members of the multidisciplinary team. Uh, didn't work with parents, uh, didn't work with stakeholders. Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, even now, working with agents yeah. to help them in terms of the messaging that they give to some of their players. But, yeah, back then it was very much you work, mm. it was sports psychology, you work with a, with a with an athlete. Yeah. Where can you see sports psychology going in the next yeah. 25 years? Um, next 25 years? Well, I th again, that that this is my biggest my biggest question is I think we've evolved a lot, but have we really evolved? Have we got more confusion now? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that keeps me awake a little bit, I suppose, is are we sport and exercise psychologists? Are we performance psychologists? Mm -hmm. And in my case, where sport might be one aspect of performance yeah. should exercise be under health mm -hmm. where does counseling yeah. organizational clinical then fit in are they components of performance yeah. and and I, and I kind of say that with what what do what do the kind of the end users want well most people will call me a performance psych even though i say no i'm a sports psych but mm -hmm. you're going to look after the performance aspects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they want to refer to you as a performance rather than sport and exercise uh if i if i look at the literature and experiences of people who have worked in sport where do they then go they might go into business they might go into military they might go into performing arts mm -hmm. which are performance yeah and they're still working at an organizational level there still might be some clinical bits and there yeah. still might be some counseling aspects but we refer to ourselves as sport and exercise. And yeah. I don't see many sport people go to exercise. Yeah. I see them go into those other places. Mm. So I think that that's probably the biggest challenge. And on the back of that, if that's such a challenge, how do we turn, how do we turn it around? Yeah. Whose responsibility is it? Is it professional bodies? Is it regulatory bodies? Where do higher education institutions fit in on that front? Um, and, I, and I think with you know the way that technology is going, we keep talking about virtual reality, psychophysiology. Well, if that's becoming part of a practitioner's skill set, where does that come within our teaching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's also uh, I wanted to ask was about where it's going to go in the next 25 years. Obviously, we've seen sports psychologists being implemented into a lot of clubs, into a lot of sports now, um, but still, I feel like there needs to be more of that. Do you think that's going to carry on increasing and it's going to become even more popular? I think it's good that um, you talk about Belgium. Oh, 100%, yeah, Belgium is, uh, the state of sports psychology in Belgium is very, uh, it's not used at all. We don't really talk about mental health back home, so uh, we're really behind. It's really a country that's behind in terms of sports psychology compared to the UK, the US. So yeah, fingers crossed for, 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 for that to develop, but how do you see, um, for example, in the UK? Do you I, think, I think the popularity is, is, is raising. Uh, there's certainly a demand for it. Yeah. Uh, my, my concern is what, is, what is the demand though? 
And that comes back to what is the expectation of the client in terms of what they want the practitioner to be able to do. Mm. Is it about performance? Is it about well-being? Is it a bit of both? Mm. Again, I'm talking quite general terms there, but you know, what, what are we saying that we can actually affect and how accountable are we? But there are many individuals who are now registered on varying training routes. Mm. There is a demand there. They're, to be on those training routes, they all have to be on placements. So there clearly is something that is very positive. Mm -hmm. And maybe the Belgium scenario is one where they might wish to kind of stop the stop the traffic a little bit and say, right, what are we what are we trying to create here? Is it sport and exercise? Is it performance? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe take stock of what's happening elsewhere. Mm, um, there's, there's lots of literature um, about identity and what are we as a profession and um, you know, some really nice papers that have come out recently uh, with, with regards to that. And mm -hmm. I think we've got an opportunity to maybe reflect and bring about some kind of change, but it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, definitely, 100%. Okay. What are some kind of lessons you've learned throughout your career? Like, what stands out for you, the kind of lessons throughout your, your, your years of practicing, would you say? Um, be comfortable. I think the first thing for me is be comfortable with who you are. Because once you have that and you know what your values are, you know what your beliefs are, you know what you're trying to achieve, hopefully you're then in a position to be able to stand by those particular values. And, yeah. and if things are not congruent to what you want or to how you might be able to work appropriately, then it's actually okay to say no. Um, but the start of of many people's careers, I suppose they want to try and fit in. They want to have an opportunity. So they might flex a little bit too far at times. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly been guilty of that in the past where you want to get a particular opportunity or you want to kind of fit in maybe a little bit and the sense of authenticity is maybe not always there. But so I think knowing, knowing yourself is probably the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part, knowing what you can do um, and what is your skill set mm -hmm. and, and knowing what you can achieve. Because if you don't know that, how can you manage the expectations of the people with whom you're working? Mm -hmm. The third thing would be around self-care. Yeah, massive one. And we have to perform as well. Um, and, and I have some really interesting discussions with a number of students about, do you make yourself available all the time if you're on a training camp or if you're abroad somewhere, whatever it might be? And if you say yes, then an athlete could phone you at whatever time in the morning. How's that affecting your performance? You, know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't phone them up the morning of their performance mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how can you set those boundaries and uh, another thing I, f for me which I think is important is knowing how you're going to get the door open yeah. mm. you know, what, what, what are the skills that or where, is your, where are your training gaps mm -hmm. yeah. and what skills do you need to be able to get the door ajar so you can then showcase what you've got mm -hmm. um, Definitely interesting. I think for, we're, we're taking a few of them boxes in terms of yeah. the first one, like knowing who we are. And um, you said talking about saying no sometimes. Um, one thing with this podcast is, you know, we've had brands come to us and say, oh, can we come on and talk about this? But And that's the first bit of money that we've been offered. Yeah. And we actually said no, because, you know, our listeners are signing up to listen to athletes, coaches, who are going to share their story and that's what they're buying into so for us to sell out like that and have someone come on and talk about something completely separate would go against yeah. what we're trying to do yeah. yeah yeah um another one was about that identity and um being different from others and, and seeing the gap you talked about um we found that with the sports psychology podcast we found especially when i was trying to listen to them on my undergrad i found some of the terminology quite difficult to listen to very difficult and um, something we're doing with this is we have a lot of student listeners um, so yeah trying to describe it in layman's terms um, so it's a really easy listen while mm -hmm. still learning a bit about sports psychology yeah yeah what was the third one that you mentioned because there was a 
there was a point I wanted to add to that because I was going to go on to two. Self, you remember? Is it self care? Yeah, self care about the burnout. Um, that's something that I've reflected on. Um, you know, I burnt out on my undergrad and my MSc, really trying to like crack it out as quick as possible. And I've come in, I, fi- I finished out a couple of months ago and just really had a reflection for a month or two about, you know, how am I going to go about my stage two? And I've decided that I'm going to spread it out over three years because, you know, I just, I need to focus on my life as well. Yeah. 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 You can get caught up in your career and, you know, especially in your twenties and you need to get everything set up. Um, but yeah, no, definitely taking a step back and, and, and having that self-care is really important. Yeah. And, and becoming qualified, it's not a race. Yeah. Mm. One of the things that you, I suppose, you want to try and ensure when you're kind of assessing candidates is that have they given themselves sufficient time to to develop a number of skills, to reflect on them, and actually see how those reflections have have resulted in in action mm. and you know, kind of longer lasting change. There are lots of people who say, oh, "I want to get it done really quickly." Well, that's that that's fine, but sometimes you can't force training. Yeah. And that's where you need a strong supervisor as well. Yeah. To have those discussions and say, well, actually, if if you're going to do it in two years, you effectively need full time. Yeah. Along with everything else as well. Yeah. So it's not a race. Yeah. Definitely. Really good advice. That it's kind of similar to me. Like I'm, I've just started the prof doc and I'm obviously I'm at the stage where I'm really ambitious. I want to get it done in what three three years, but I've really had that reflection like you. It's, it's not a race. And talking to people here that have told me the benefits of taking your time and having that reflection process has definitely uh, changed my mindset a bit. Um, mm. Definitely. Mm. I think it's about as well, because, you know, let, let's not be, let's not be around the bush, you know, earning money is important. Yep. And I mean, you can still earn money as a trainee and it's about, you know, you talked about not underselling the, yeah. the what was it? The profession said? is yeah, it's, yeah. It's if like you don't charge for as being trainees, we're tempted to not charge for our services right at the beginning. But in fact, we're kind of hurting the profession by doing that mm. because we're not only charging for that session, we're charging for the undergrad we've done, the masters we've done, and we have a lot of knowledge, you know, and it, we're not, mm-hmm. it's not like we're at, at the start. We do have knowledge. So yeah, it's, yeah. That's super important for for our listeners because we have a lot of student listeners. Um, what are some challenges? Uh, I think this is going to be important as well for up and coming sports psychologists. What challenges are they going to face um, into the, when they get into their sports psychology career? I think access is always one ongoing challenge, mm. and having having an ability. Uh, one of my favourite papers is by Simpson, and it's about the elevator pitch. Okay. And a question that lots of people get put to them is, so what, what is psychology or what is sports psychology and how are you going to be of benefit to us? Why should I work with you? you know, those types of questions. Mm. So having responses that you can call upon, depending upon the context and who's asking it, because it could be chief exec it could be a performance director it could be a coach it could be a a parent it could be a sibling Mm. who's looking to employ it could be the athlete direct Mm. how how do you how do you respond to that and what are you setting yourself up for uh you know what can you realistically deliver we see now within uh again a lot of studies the uh, brief brief solution therapy or there might be the the single session approaches yeah. uh, versus the oh no you know the the CBT which might take X number of weeks and so being able to read well what is this person after mm. um, and understanding the context I think that's probably one of the biggest things and the the, the other piece of advice is do your homework mm. do your homework about the sport. Uh, the structures um, nowadays. There's lots of information available online. Yeah. Might not always be true, mm. admittedly, but you can dig around and find out about things. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and also show a little bit of humility and vulnerability at times. And you don't have to be an expert in their sport. They're the expert in the sport. You're the expert in your field. 100%. And you're trying to work as a, as a we. And I, I recall um, one of my favorite chapters is by Mark Anderson in the book doing sports psychology that i think is being redone at the moment as well okay so that would be that would be a fantastic good, good uh, addition to the literature but in there in that first chapter he talks about finding the we so you're eradicating power struggles you're mm. you're eradicating you know they are in control it's uh, well actually you've got your knowledge i've got my knowledge how we how are we going to work together and trying to find that congruence yeah, yeah. rather than this yeah you, you, i'm more important than you or you're more yeah. important than me mm. that's something as well you spoke about at the start like having some sort of knowledge show within that sport that's something that i've really focused on and i'd recommend to to any students um i've started just trying to get into as many sports as possible and really looking around them sports, getting to know some teams and that. So we've recently got into basketball, NFL, um, tennis, football. obviously we're experts in football. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's been really good. Yeah. Learning about new sports and that. Yeah, it's been really good. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think needs to be done for sports teams and athletes to uh, value sports psychology more? I think we, we probably we probably just need to be very clear about what we can and what we can't do. Okay. Um, too, too much of the time we might have this, uh, people might have the perception we have mystical powers or, you know, we can wave a magic wand and everything's going to be okay. Hmm. We, we're trying to bring about some kind of behavior change for long, that's long, long lasting. Yeah. Um, it might be emotion management. It might be thought processes, whatever it might be. But these things aren't going to happen straight away. And, you know, Ian Mitchell talks about the glue, mm. uh, how it helps, how the psychology helps a lot of areas work together. But if, if, a, if a performer were going to work on a new skill, they wouldn't expect immediate change yeah. that would be long lasting. They might have immediate success mm. and then it will probably degrade again quite quickly. And that's the same here you know, we're, we're asking them to do something that is different mm -hmm. and we're trying to break down something maybe that has not worked for a prolonged period of time or it could be that we're trying to maintain behaviors that have been working and we're trying to protect against them being broken down mm -hmm. depends what the context is um so i think we need to be very clear about what we can and what we can't do and and also try and demystify the issue that psychology is about problems all the time yeah definitely that's something we do on this we, podcast like it's really about not just solving problems but improving performance on our business card and here it's solve improve maximize so like yeah. the three pillars we work towards yeah yeah, yeah it's and, and and there's a psychology of kind of yeah we might go with a lot of the psychology of failure but there's also a lot of stuff to consider with the psychology of success mm. because yeah. of the things that success brings with it. And yeah. there are notable examples, many, many examples of recent times. Emma Raducanu is a good example. Yeah. yeah. Um, a great success, fantastic success. Mm. And all of a sudden the expectation of that, that one off as it is at the moment mm. has become unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. How do you maintain that? That's really the key, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's and, so and when you're when you're top of the tree at something, you're there to be chased. Yeah. So how do you keep that advantage? And that's a very different type of work that you're doing Completely. compared to if you're the chaser. Mm. I find that with Anthony Joshua, that like, seems to be a recurring thing with him, uh, trying to like keep himself at the top, and he seems to be you know struggling with that a little bit. So yeah, so I mean, this is why we love sports psychology. Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, for our listeners who are sports psychology students, what advice would you give them if they're to have a successful sports psychology career? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that is, that's a loaded question, yeah. that one. Um, accept the fact it's not always going to be plain sailing. Mm -hmm. uh, working in environments such as professional football ain't always glamorous. Yeah. You know, be careful what you wish for sometimes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, be very clear about 
what you are trying to achieve and what you are standing by. Mm. And don't let the organisation or the sport or the, the characters that you're maybe wanting to work with, don't let them overpower what you're trying to do. Mm. So your job effectively is to try and bring about some, most of the time, about bringing some positive change or a sustained positive set of behaviours or whatever it might be. But yeah, don't don't let don't, don't always think that there's the glamour job out there. Yeah, because uh, a lot of the time you might be, unfortunately, very very disappointed. Yeah, and um, you're probably always going to be blamed for something. Yeah. So we need to be rational about things as well, practicing what we preach. Yeah. So whether it's as I said earlier, the self care, or whether it's the the use of of psychological skills or whether it's the mm. behavioral aspects where we present ourselves as being astute mm. assured individuals um because that's part of the interpersonal skills that's going to help open the door and mm. if if you're a, a shy mousy um person who can't get their words out mm. and who looks as though they're really struggling to be there physically then what kind of messages does that give away? Because ultimately you might be trying to work with a player or a performer or whoever it might be saying, well, if I'm playing against you, then yeah. what, what do you think I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, especially that practicing what you preach, like that's something we're trying to do on a, on a daily basis and still have struggles with it now. Yeah. Um, I'm sure every sports psych does, to be honest. Um, Maybe it's even sports like seeing sports sites. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, quite. And and one of the other things that we often say to, to people who are going coming towards the end of their their training, their supervision process, is just because you've qualified, that doesn't mean you don't have supervision. Mm. You know, maintain some kind of supervision. Yeah. Even if it's and sometimes it's better to do it with someone who wasn't your supervisor so you get a different perspective yeah. Yeah. and there are many individuals who, who give professional supervision where they can just talk through cases mm. or discuss you know, various things mm. about practice um, just to share share ideas and it's done in a obviously a confidential but, but thoroughly professional manner mm -hmm. some individuals might have kind of clinical sites as as supervisors depending upon the organization but yeah the, the i suppose you have to embrace the idea of lifelong learning yeah. which i know sounds a bit cliched but uh as, as as i've certainly experienced where i was 25 years ago is you know, we're in a very very different place now mm -hmm. and yeah we kind of it, we're, we're in the i world aren't we in terms mm -hmm. of internet iphones or whatever it might be and yeah. we've got to be understanding of what 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 the market wants yeah, yeah. the thing is like we're, we're, we're making content for bps through this uh, so like th this will be like fed throughout the year uh, making clips out of it so i think i think social media is the game at the moment it is and uh that's something we're really trying to capitalize on <laughs> last time yeah for sure but, uh, yeah. yeah no i think that's a that's a good place to uh, end it thanks so much for coming in and spending some time with us i know you're you're a busy man so yeah, yeah no we really appreciate it no, thank you and well done for what you've you've been doing here in terms of providing additional materials for people yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's going to be very valuable to our, to our listeners so yeah, no, thanks so much. Thanks Bro. so much. Cheers. Oh, Cheers, guys. You.